message. And so here we are coming with uh, part two of when the glory returned, when the glory returned. And it comes from the book of Second Samuel chapter six, but we will pick up our reading at verses 11. And um, I'll let you know where we'll go from there. Uh, but we'll start at Second Samuel chapter six, uh, reading at verses uh, 11, starting at verse 11. It says, and the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. It was told King David saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And it was so that when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with, an ephod, uh, with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of of the trumpet. Let's skip down now to verse 20. Then David returned to bless his household and Michael, the, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaid, handmaids of his servant as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovered himself. And David said unto Michael, it was before the Lord which chose me before thy father and before all his house to appoint me to rule over the people of God, over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord and I will yet be more vile than thus, and I will be base in my own sight. And of the hand and of the maid servants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. In the last verse, verse 23, therefore Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child unto the day of her death. When the glory returns, we read. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 11 through 15, verses 20 through 23. When the glory returns. And um, I don't know about you all, but I said this last week and it, and it, and it bears saying again, I want God in my house. I want God in my house. I need God in my house. I don't know about you, but I need God. I want God in my house. Hallelujah. Anybody agree with me? I want God in my house. At the time of this text, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, Israel had been, and I'm going to bring you up to this point, Israel had been without the glory of God for 70 years. God allowed the Ark of the Covenant to be captured by the Philistines because of the failure of Eli the priest and the wickedness of his sons Phinehas and Hophni. What was the failure of Eli? In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 29, we see the man of God comes to Eli and tells him that he honored his sons above God by permitting them to rob the people of the portions of offerings that belong to them and they kept the portions for themselves. 
Eli the priest also permitted them to sleep with the women that were dedicated to the sanctuary. First Samuel chapter two, verse 12 tells us that the sons of Eli, the scripture says that they were sons of Belial. Now, Belial is another name for the devil. Then it goes on to say that they knew not the Lord. Wait a minute. These were priests and the Bible says they knew not the Lord. And the proof that they did not know the Lord was in their actions. The unrighteousness of the leaders, I want you to hear this, caused God's people. You can read this in 1 Samuel chapter 2. It caused God's people to despise, number one, the worship of the one true God. And it caused the people to lose respect for the priesthood. What do you mean? What do you mean the unrighteousness of the leaders caused the people to despise the worship of Jehovah, to lose respect for the priesthood? What do you mean they despise the worship? The unchecked sin of the leaders caused the people to disrespect God by not bringing him the required offerings. Few are willing to admit this. I hope you got your seatbelts on this morning. Few are willing to put the initial blame where it really belongs. Yes, the people were wrong for, for despising or the scriptures are abhorring the offerings. Yes, they were wrong. But the man of God tells Eli that they were the cause of it. People disrespected the priesthood because of their conduct. My God. Can I say this? Well, I'm going to say it anyway. Many have stopped serving the Lord because of what they see going on now between Eli and the sons of Belial in worship. My God. In leadership. They don't respect God and many of us and many of them don't respect the leaders either. And we tell people, ah, well, you're not supposed to look at people. You need to just look at God. But that's not what the word of the Lord says. In Ephesians 4 and 1, he tells us to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. So when you, you have a responsibility, you have a responsibility and you have a responsibility not just to God, but to but to them as well. You have a responsibility to live right and you have a responsibility to do right. And if you call someone to life, praise God. But if if you cause someone to stumble or to disrespect God or the ministry because they see you in the liquor store, if you cause the people to respect or disrespect God because they see you at the hotel slipping and tipping, peeping and creeping, or if they see you mishandling the offerings, the word says it is better that you would have a weight around your neck and to drown in the sea. My God. And for this reason, Israel lost the glory. Unchecked sin causes the glory of the Lord to depart. Oh, yes, it does. When God returns, unchecked sin, I think I need to say that again, causes the glory of the Lord to depart. My, my God, my God, my God. Oh, yes, 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 yes. When God returned. So what they did mattered. And what you do does matter before God. I don't care what anyone says. What you do does matter before the Lord. And nobody really wants to say this. But much of the problem in the body of Christ is a result of the glory being gone. What? 
gone because of, 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 of blind, bloated Eli and the sons of Belial who have the position, but they are living like the devil. I said in a post yesterday, uh, are gone because of Reverend Hooper Loop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who want to give a song and a, 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 and a, and a tune, but not living 10 cents worth of anything. And, and, and many are wondering why um, we can't get people to give and to participate. And the reason is because they see you and your underhanded lifestyle. See, see, we haven't given the people of God, the real people of God, credit here. Because people are not as blind as you think. They see the winking and the blinking. They see the feeling and the stealing. They've caught on to the wheeling and the dealings and the prophetic games that you played to get their money. And you promised them that in 10 days and in 15 days that they would get a breakthrough if they sold the seed. And so they sold the seed and 10 days and 30 days like you said and 40 days and 60 days and two years and five years came and they still have not gotten this particular promise that you guaranteed them that would happen if they sold their seed. Lord have mercy. And you have caused the people to have a disdain for the things of God and to make them feel like nobody's right. Oh, help us God today. Help us God today. But when David became king over all of Israel, oh yes, it's going to be a little tight. He gathered his men together not to conquer more territory or to lay out a military strategy. At the beginning of this um chapter, you'll see David gathered the men together to bring back the ark of the Lord to Jerusalem. David said, I want the glory of the Lord back. I want the power of God back. I want the presence of God back. I want to bring the ark back to Jerusalem where it belongs. All right. He said, I want the glory of the Lord back. Come on, come on. And there are there, there are others. I got to hit this part right quick before I move on. Who may not be you say, well, well, I'm not uh, Eli or the sons of Belial because I'm living all that I know how to do. Come on. You may not be uh, living in outright uh, 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 sin, but some of y'all are dead. Come on, some of y'all dead as a doorknob. See, some may not be living in sin, but you relishing on the memories of how God used to use you or how God moved in your church. Back in the day when mother so-and-so was alive and brother so-and-so was alive and this one was alive and the power of God flowed and we saw so many people healed and saved and delivered and, and blind eyes open and people getting out of wheelchairs. Let me, let me say this right quick. Let me tell you, if you can remember a time that you operated in the presence of God or the anointing of God more than you do right now, then that's an indication that something is wrong. That means that you've lost something along the way. Oh, my God, my God. See, because we're supposed to be going from glory to glory, from faith to faith, not looking back at what was and going on the residue and the fumes off of what God did back in the day. My God. But we got to be like David and say, I want the glory back. I want the presence of the Lord back. I want God in my house. I need God in my house. And, and I believe this is why God calls David a man after his own heart. Because David realized that what he needed most, y'all hear me, was the presence of God. Oh, when will we get this? When will we get this for real? What we really need is not a political turnover, not a social reform, not an action plan, not a conference in a Zoom chat room. We need the glory of God. What we need most in this nation is not an economic stimulus. We need the power of God manifested to stimulate the heart and the lives of people. 
Oh yeah, that's what we need. Because only the power of God can change a heart. Only the power of God can change a people. Only the power of God can change a nation. You hear me? We need the glory of God. When see, see, we'll see a change when the glory of God really returns. Come on. We need the glory of God in our house. Come on. In the schoolhouse, in the church house, in the White House. We need the power of God, the power that can change, heal, and deliver the soul of man. Many people act the way they act because they don't have anything on the inside of them to direct them and change them. No one can say they are filled with the Holy Ghost and hate people and kill people and murder people and lie and cheat and steal. Come on, come on here. God's people don't do that. God's man don't do that. God's woman don't do that. Come on here. Come on here. We need the power of God. Mm -hmm. From the back to the front. From the top to the bottom. To each side. My God, we need the glory of God. So David, as I said last week, he had good intentions. But he went about it the wrong way. Many of you don't realize sometimes you can do the right thing in a wrong way and still mess up. It was right for him to want the glory of God. But he did something wrong. David and his men went to go after the ark, but they made a tragic error. Instead of the priest carrying it on poles as provided for in the law of Moses, they made a new cart to bring the ark to Jerusalem. They copied the way of the Philistines. And the way of the Philistines is the way of the world. Uh, many have become so impressed with the way of the Philistines that they copy their way or the way of the world. They copy their terminology. They copy their style. They copy their plan. They copy their business model. But God has laid out in his word how he want, how he wanted his presence to be handled, but they decided on the new cart. And so the new cart represents any way, and you can look at this between verses 1 through 12, um, and the new card represents any way that one deviates from God's established pattern to substitute it with their own. That's what it means by a new card. A new card. And, 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 and so what has happened today is we're trying to bring the presence of God. We're trying to bring the glory of God. We're trying to bring the spirit of God on a new card. And God ain't having it. Uh huh. Uh, we moved away from foundational preaching and teaching of the gospel to these new card revelations. Uh huh. Move from the simplicity of faith in Christ alone and we move to another gospel. And I termed it, I call it a Franken gospel. I mean, some that you just made and you just stitched up because it wasn't enough. And then out of this Franken gospel came a Franken faith. It's a man-made faith saying to have faith in faith, to have faith in confessions, faith in your giving. And, 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 and this is a new card. And then many are frustrated because it's not working. And so they try this and they try that, trying to get something to work almost like someone in a casino trying Trying to pull a lever to see, hey, maybe it'll come through this way or maybe it'll come through this way. Last week you was on this. Uh, uh, next week you'll be on something else. Next month you'll be on uh, another thing. Trying to find something that will work. And now you have to do this and that uh -huh, be because now the blood and the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Ghost isn't enough. And what God is saying, everything else is a new card. It's a new card. Uh huh. We've substituted. Oh yeah, I'm preaching hard this morning. We substituted the power of the blood for humanistic psychology. Substituted the preaching of the cross for life coaching in the pulpit. Uh huh. Talking about the cross is old school and it's boring and all of that, and we need to move on to greater. But see, old school is what saved. Old school is what delivers. Glory be to God. Old 
old schools and what set free. Come on, old school and what paves the way uh, for the baptism in the Holy Ghost. See, we have people who claim to be educated. They claim to be seasoned. They claim to be master students of the word, but they don't even know the foundational principles of the gospel. Can't even live saved. Lord, have mercy for one day to the next. And when you don't know the foundational principles of the gospel, any revelation that you get is going to be off because your foundation is off. My God, the new cart, talking about the new cart. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I hope y'all ready to roll with me. Praise God. Chapter 2, verse 2, he says, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He said, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. He says, And my speech and my preaching was not in enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and a power. He said that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Bless his name. First Corinthians 1 and 18 says, for the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Acts 1 and 8 says, but ye shall receive power. Somebody say power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. My God, hallelujah. Bless his name. But they put the ark on a new cart. And this new cart was driven by Uzzah and Ohio. Steering the ark of God on what they built. On what they manufactured. And they thought. That they were doing God's work. Lord have mercy. And so they had all manner of instruments and hearts and symbols. And they had the accoutrements of worship. They had the form of worship. But the power of God was absent. See, we got to understand talent, charisma, vocal ability, and musical skill is not in and of itself representative of the power of God. Come on here. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof simply because uh, they did not do it God's way, my Lord. But when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Nacon's threshing floor, and uh, it was a specially prepared place for threshing, And to thresh means to tramp or to stomp heavily with the feet. So when they came to the threshing floor, a place of trampling or stomping, see the threshing floor, let me say this, is a place where wheat is trampled. Hear me, wheat is trampled to separate the grain from the chaff. It is where the wheat is broken to separate what's needed from what must be discarded. It's a place of trampling so so that what is needed and you and uh, usable can be drawn out and what is not needed can be discarded or thrown away. So when they got to this place, Nacon's threshing floor, It says that the oxen stumbled and shook the cart. This was a place that was especially prepared for oxen to trample. So by natural means, oxen should not stumble. But God shook the cart. Can somebody say God shook the cart? God shook the cart. God shook the cart. And God is shaking new cards. Everything that can be shaken in this day and hour will be shaken. Uh-huh. He's shaking your life to 
reveal what's needed and what's not. He's shaking the economy to show you who's really your source. He's shaking relationships so, so, so that you won't put your trust in men. And he's shaking the body of Christ so that you can see the true state of where you are and the things that you depended on and the things that you thought you needed to survive. Come on. God said, I'm shaking it to show you where you are. I'm shaking it. Lord have mercy. God shook the car and God is still shaking new cars. He's shaking new cars. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to give God praise. If you haven't shared this, go on and share this right now. God is shaking it. He's shaking it. And other put forth his hand to steady the ark to keep it from falling. Like I said, he probably thought he was doing a good thing. And I said this last week and it bears repeating again. When man uh, uh, builds something or he sets it up, he feels obligated to sustain it or to hold it up. But God was saying enough is enough. It's time to shake this man driven ox carrying new car. And what God is saying is that it is time out for all of this man made stuff. And so what I am doing, see don't blame everything on the devil. God said what I'm doing in this. Yes the devil has his part but God said but what I'm doing is I'm shaking the cart because I want to show you what's real and what's not. Lord have mercy. He's shaking new cards. And so in Numbers 4, God had told them that the ark was not to be touched. And if they did, they would die. So when Uzzah touched it, he died. Uzzah name means strength. So what God was saying is that I don't need your strength. I don't need your flesh, Uzzah, to hold me up. See, no man has the right to expect God to break his own laws for their benefit. Now, remember I said that the threshing floor was a place for the trampling of the wheat to separate the grain from the chaff? The wheat was broken and the chaff was blown away. Well, David, which represents the wheat, uh, at this breach, he was broken. He was horrified by Uzzah's death. And he said, how can I get the glory of the Lord back? And that's what God wants many of us. Many are trying to figure out how they can get people to be more faithful to the church. How we can get resources flowing even in our personal life. But this shaking is designed uh, to 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 break the wheat, but it's also designed to blow away the chaff. Uh -huh. And we missed it. And we should be crying like David. Uh, how can we get the glory of the Lord back? But many of us are too busy pretending like we have the glory. My, my God, my God. But we got to be like David and say, how can we get the glory of the Lord back? How can we get the presence of God among us like he's supposed to be? How can I get the glory of God in my house for real? like it's supposed to be. I don't need to break my neck to come into a building and just so I can get a breakthrough to come back to my life and my personal life is hell. Come on. I need the glory of God in my personal life. I need the glory of God in my house. Come on. Like he's supposed to be. Evidently, come on. If he's not, something is wrong. And so we need to see what is what it, what it is for real. And that's what we're missing. We're missing that cry of David. That hunger and thirst for righteousness. The power of God to transform hearts and lives. Whew. And God had to check David. He had to check him. Because he wanted David to reverence him. God did not excuse David nor Israel who was his beloved people. When they broke his laws. Because God is holy. He's just and he's true. So if he's just. This means that he is under obligation. To not only bless them. For obedience. But he's also because he's just. He's under obligation. To curse them for disobedience. He wanted to show David. 
Look, he wanted David to know you just can't do things your way and expect me to bless it. See, David went in there high, but he came out low. Y'all hear me? He went in there with a swagger, but he came out with a stagger. Where is the reverence of God, God is saying, for the things of God? We think that things are going on in the world today that they are for the sinner. But what God is doing, he's checking the wheat. And God is showing us that he's not playing. My God, he's not playing. So in the meantime, David left the ark at Obed's Edom house. And it is assumed that Obed Edom found out how to attend the ark of the Lord because the same thing didn't happen to, to him when it was in uh, Philistines, nor did the same thing happen to him when uh, David tried to uh, uh, bring the ark back in a wrong way. So, so, so it is assumed that he found out how to attend the ark. It says because the three months that the ark was at his house. It said the Lord blessed Obed, Edom, and all of his household. The Lord not only blessed Obed, but he blessed everything that was connected to him because he regarded the presence of God and he learned how to handle the gift that was given to him. He was blessed because of the glory of God. Lord, have mercy. May we be blessed when we get the glory of God in our house. I'll, I'll say it again. I need God in my house. I guess that's my subtopic of when the glory returns. I need God in my house. Hallelujah. So someone went and told David how the Lord had blessed the house of Obed-Edom. And this time he went up with gladness. So why was he glad this time? How was this time different from the last time? In verse 13, it says, and it was so when they that bear the ark of the Lord. Let me, let me, let me start right there. If you read the, uh, the same account of this story in first Chronicles chapter 15, verse two, it reads like this. David said, none ought to carry the ark of God, but the Levites for them hath the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. And then verse 12 of first, first Chronicles 15, it says, and he said unto them, ye are the chief fathers of the Levites. Sanctify yourself, both ye and your brethren, that ye may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel unto the place I have prepared it. For ye did it not at the first. The Lord made a breach upon us for we, for that we sought him not after the due order. In other words, he's saying that, that, that us are died because we did not seek the Lord about how that we are supposed to do this thing, not after the due order. So this indicates to us that David made proper investigation as to why Uzzah was killed. He read the law of Moses on how to handle the ark. So now he used the proper priests that were consecrated to carry it on their shoulders. Verse 13, let's not miss this. David had the singers. He had the uh, dancers, he had the musicians, he had the bearers of the tabernacle instruments, he now had the priests, he had the animals, and he had everything, and they were in a procession to bring the ark now back to uh, Jerusalem. He brought it with gladness because now he know he was doing the thing right. So you cannot handle the presence of God anyway. God does not want to be brought in on a new car uh, 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 um, with men driving it, uh, held up by uh, oxen. He wanted the priest uh, to carry uh, the ark, which is the gospel in picture form on poles on their shoulders. Yes, yes, yes. So this procession, they were carrying the ark back to Jerusalem with, with gladness. And look at verse 13. It says, I read it again. And it was so when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, it says he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. Okay. 
When they had gone about six paces, which were 18 feet, it says they stopped and sacrificed oxen and fatlings. David said, wait a minute. We're going back and we're happy. But, but the priests must offer sin offerings unto the Lord. The priests have got to pour blood on this mercy seat. Because God had already laid out in Exodus 25 is that when the priest poured blood on the mercy seat, that God would come in and dwell in between the uh, cherubims. Uh, uh, um, so, so God dwells between the cherubims, David understood, because of the blood. And so David, when they went uh, uh, six paces or 18 feet, he stopped the whole procession and sacrificed oxen and fatling. Because David would say, even though I've gone this far, I got to stop. David was saying, I made it this far because of the blood. I wish somebody could give God praise right now. I'm going to pause for a minute for somebody to give God praise and say, I made it this far because of the blood. It wasn't because of my own doing. I made it this far because of the blood. Lord have mercy. If I could get up and run right now, I would. Lord, I made it this far because of the blood. My God. Glory be to God. Did you make it? Come on. Can somebody testify and say, I made it this far because of the blood. This far because of the blood. So David danced with all of his might and he was girded with a linen ephod. It seems, listen, listen, every line in the word of God is loaded with revelation. It says, verse 14, David danced before the Lord with all his might and was girded with the linen ephod. Now, David was a king. Kings wore robes. A linen ephod was the garment of an ordinary priest. David, being a type of Christ, a king and a priest, uh -huh, shows us that he humbled himself. Come on. He took off his kingly robe and he put on the form of a servant because David understood that this is not about me. I am bringing the presence of God and in the presence of God, I am not a king. I am a servant. Oh, if we could get that, if we could abandon titles and become servants and worship the one who really sits on the throne. Oh, if we could just do that. We see this pattern in heavenly worship. If you look at Revelation chapter 4, we, we see this pattern when the heavenly creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him that sit on the throne. It says that the 24 elders fell down before him. Now the 24 elders represent the company of the redeemed. The 24 elders represent us. The 24 elders represent the same. It says that the 24 elders fell down before the throne. All right. In other words, I know you gave this throne to me. You said that, that I was going to rule as a king and we're going to rule as priests. But the 24 elders said, God, I know that you gave this to me, but in your presence, it means nothing. Come on, come on. And it says they cast their crowns down before the throne. Yeah, God, you, you gave me this throne, this crown, but right now it's all about you. See, many of us, we're too busy trying to hold on to our crowns and to hold on to our seats and we're too high. And what God is saying, throw it down. Forget where you come from. Throw it down and be a servant. Throw it down and give me praise. Throw it down and give me worship. Throw your crown down. Get out of your seat. You forgot what I've done for you. You've forgotten how I brought you out. Lord have mercy. Throw it down. Throw it down. Hallelujah. Then David comes back to Jerusalem after he makes the sacrifice, after the priest makes the sacrifice, he dances with all of his might because he's so glad that he finally got back what he was longing for. He finally got it. He got it right. He did it the right way, my Lord. And so he came back to Jerusalem to bless his house. But his wife, Michael, 
saw him dancing. And instead of being at the head of the women meeting the procession as they came into the city with joy, she did not make him welcome. She met him with sharp, bitter words. The scripture says she despised him in her heart. She, she, she said, David, you're acting like one of the vain fellows. You know, vain means worthless. Vain means empty. Vain means void. She said, you're acting like you are nothing. You are acting just like you are nobody. Come on. She thought that he had disgraced himself and lowered himself because he was a king. And this was David's response to her. Verse 21 said, and David said to Michael, it was before the Lord, which chose me before my father in all his house. In other words, David said, it was the Lord that chose me. Come on. In my father's house, when they didn't even think I was worthy enough to stand before the prophet, they didn't even include me in it. He said, it was God who chose me before my father's house. It was God who anointed me in the midst of my brethren. It was God who kept me from being killed by Saul, who was trying all he knew. It was God who kept me from your daddy, who been trying to kill me ever since. Come on, the anointing has came on me. David said, it was God who appointed me to be ruler over all of Israel. And because it was God, he said, therefore will I play before the Lord. He wasn't talking about playing an instrument right there. He was talking about, it was for the Lord that I would play. That was um, a term for exuberant dance. He said, so, so, so God chose me. So it is before the Lord that I do all of this. And since you think I'm vile, he said, I'm going to be more vile. Since you think I'm worthless, I'm going to be more worthless. I will be vain in my own sight. In other words, he's saying, if my praise and my worship is vile, then I'm going to worship him all the more because it was God that did this for me. And I'm going to do it whether it's honorable in your sight or not. And it says here, whoo, my God, my God, you ain't seen nothing yet. My God, you ain't seen nothing yet. That's what you say. And then the scripture says, it says, therefore, Michael had no child until the day of her death. So we don't know if David had no more relations with her as husband and wife because she despised them or not. But what we do know, that barrenness was a result of her despising David. See, barrenness is the inability to produce that comes from despising the things of God. And God said, many of us have become, as Philippians chapter 3 describes, has become enemies of the cross because we despise that. And, 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 and we feel like that we need to move on to something else because that's not important enough. That's not necessary. That's not deep enough. Baby, you don't even understand fundamental principles if you think that that's not deep enough. In eternity, we will spend all of eternity learning the depths of what Christ did on the cross and what it accomplished. So we had to make sure that we don't have the spirit of Michael and become enemies and despisers of what God is doing. Lord have mercy. David learned a costly lesson, a costly lesson. And so must we. We must get back to what really matters. And that's God's way. The way he prescribed in his word, put away the new cart. And do like Jude tells us and exhorts us to do. To earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered for the saints. And if you don't know anything else about me, I want you to understand this. That I am a contender for the faith. I'm a contender for the original faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Because it was 
through this original faith that the devil was defeated. It was through this original faith that the penalty of sin was paid. It's through this original faith that the back of sin was broken. It is through this original faith that you are justified. You are made a new creature in Christ. It is through this original original faith that you are sanctified. It is through this original faith that you be baptized with the Holy Ghost. It is through this original faith that you will be glorified. Christ is your example because he died, he buried, and he was buried, and he rose on the third day, and his resurrection guaranteed your resurrection. And so when we preach this gospel of Jesus Christ, come on, come on, that's not a new cart. Come on here. We need to get back to the original thing. See, and we look at the Bible, and we want the power of the apostles, and we want the power of the early church, but we want to bring it in on a new cart. Mm-hmm. God said, not so. God said, not so. I'm shaking new cards. Come on, new cards bring death. Christ and what he did at the cross is enough. The leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit in your day-to-day -day life, causing you to flesh out Christ in the earth realm is enough. God doesn't need us to do his job. We must get back to the altar. Y'all hear me? The simplicity of the gospel, which is God's due order. Faith in Christ's finished work. Preaching and teaching the gospel. Not the principles of the gospel, but preaching Jesus. Making his name great. That's what God is requiring of us. That souls may be saved for the kingdom of God. New carts and oxen bring death. A bloodless gospel is a dead gospel. A crossless gospel is a dead gospel. When we go back to what God is requiring of us, that is to Luke 9, 23. And he said to them all who would come after me, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow him. Also, he is calling us like the priest to bear this gospel on four poles, carrying it, carrying this blood-stained gospel, carrying this message of the cross, this blood-stained banner on our shoulders into the four corners of the earth. And as we do this, I said, as we do this, the glory of God will return and the glory of God will bless our nation and our house as well. God said, I'm not coming in on a new car. I'm coming in on what I already ordained. I'm coming in on what I already established. Because what I established is enough. It's all that's necessary. Christ plus nothing equals everything you need. Christ plus nothing equal everything you need. When the glory returns. We'll see God move like never before. Bless you. I love you with the love of God. Like this video. Share this video. Until next time, may the Lord bless you real good.